number 63. <clears throat> number 63. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Bye. 
and his lost sheep that was hungry and cold. So I believe I'll go home and eat with the Father. The table is spread and they're waiting for me. I can see the Father Man. 
master of the sea. Though the storms of life may rage and the billows round you roll, he can calm life's troubled sea. Upon last you say, trust in him who never fails. I'm so glad he sails with me. He's a master of the sea. When he reaches out his hand, Bill sees at his command. Winds and waves obey his man is this they all did say that the winds and seas obey he's the one who sails with me he's the master of the sea he's the one who sails with me he's the master of the to bring 
you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And we want to add our agreement to what Brother Bill said. I really appreciate the singing. Those who have come from other churches to hear the Word of God. And we hope we've been a blessing to you and we want to continue that tonight. I try when I have the privilege to preach in revival meetings at some point to bring a message concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always been an inspiration to me and something that makes me to stop and to think a little more soberly about life and some of the things that may be going on in my life to think about the Lord's return. And certainly that's true in the day we're living more so now than it ever has been. So I want to preach tonight concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in Matthew chapter 24, begin reading with me in the 32nd verse. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye you know that summer is nigh, so likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of no were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that no entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Jesus preached repeatedly about his return to this earth even before he was crucified he pressed upon the disciples many times to be ready for his second coming now they didn't understand his death they didn't understand that he was going to be crucified and they understood very little what he was saying about the second return but Jesus wrote these things I believe particularly for the day that you and I are living now I'm not going out on a limb and I'm not going to say the Lord's coming back in two years or next week or tomorrow or anything else. But I am saying to you that Jesus wrote these words for this generation that you and I are living in. I believe the coming of the Lord is that close. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's very close. Jesus emphasized again and again to be ready. Note, if you will, those verse uh, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, but my Father only. We don't know the day. In verses 40 and 41, he says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Teaching us concerning the rapture, that it's going to happen instantly, it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we're going to be taken away. Some are going to be left. Those who belong to Christ, those who are in Christ, including the dead in Christ, they'll be raised first, and we're going to be taken away in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. We're to be ready. Jesus gives us, in verse 37, a warning. And I believe he gives us something here that we can look to to determine that this is indeed the time of the second coming of the Lord. He says, but as the days of Noah, now of course that in the translation it's Noah, I hope you understand that, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus points us back to the Old Testament scriptures again. I love to study and I love to preach from the Old Testament. Some people don't believe you ought to preach from the Old Testament. <laughs> they're going to be in trouble if they come and, and listen to my church because they're going to hear a lot of it. Jesus preached from the Old Testament. Or repeatedly he preached from the Old Testament. And he warns us and teaches us to go back and study and know what was going on in the days of Noah. And he says, compare what's going on in the days of Noah with what's going on in the generation that you're living in. And if they appear to be the same, then be ready. Isn't that what he said? Be ready. Because he says, this generation shall not pass away till the Son of Man We'll come back again. So let's go back today, tonight, in Genesis chapter 6. And let's make some comparisons of the time of Noah with our day. And that's what we want to do. The days of Noah. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, even so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Genesis 6 verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, I want you to pay particular attention to this because it follows verse 2. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. 
Now, I want you to read that because I want you to notice that in verse 2, something happened that caused God to set a time. Something is going on in verse 2 that caused God to set a time. He said, His day shall be 120 years. Now notice in verse 4, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I, have to, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. I want you also to notice something in verse 17. God says, and I, even I. The destruction of the first world was not a catastrophe brought about by the elements but it was a direct act of God Amen. where God himself said I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth now beloved I, it really doesn't matter it's immaterial what scientists and men of so called learning think God said I did it purposely willfully I wanted to do it and I did it I brought a flood upon the whole earth and we can't read all about the flood tonight. We want to just look at these verses that we've read to you. And I want to show you some things that God has opened my eyes about concerning the days of Noah. And I want you to think with me. The days of Noah, on the one hand, what was going on in the days of Noah. And we want to try to compare those. And I want you to think about what's going on around you. And compare what was going on in the days of Noah with what's going on in your lifetime today. Because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, even so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And beloved, we ought not to be without understanding when God makes it that plain, should we? It's plain. It's very clear. Look with me first of all, back in chapter 6 and verse 1. We know that God had created Adam and Eve and of course they fell in the garden as we preached the other night. They fell into sin. Men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Now you know that God had promised Adam and Eve that through the seed of the woman there would come a redeemer, a savior. And if you look in the preceding chapters you'll see that there was a line of men, godly men, Men who were, I believe, the recipients of the covenant. And you can trace the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ back to Adam as you'll find in the book of Luke. And you'll trace them right back through chapter 6 and back through Noah and then right back to the very point of the beginning to Adam. These were godly men. But the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Now notice verse 2, that the sons of God, now some people try to make that angels, but it's not. It's those godly men, 
is that line through whom Christ would come, those who were born in good families with the right background and with the teaching from God who begin, as it says here, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. They begin to intermarry with the same men that you'll find also in the book of Genesis find, uh, following the line of Cain. Now Cain was a wicked man. He would not. He would not accept God's way of salvation. And he slew his brother. And the descendants of Cain and those who were not the sons of God as described here were wicked men. And they had daughters born unto them, but they were beautiful daughters, good men to look upon. And the Bible says the sons of God began to look upon them and they uh, took them wives of all which they chose. Now, beloved, you compare that with what's going on. In our Baptist churches today, it breaks my heart I don't know what else to do as a pastor and as a man of God who has to preach to the people of God. It seems no matter how much you warn our young people, no matter how much you emphasize to keep yourself separate from the world and you warn them not to intermarry with people who are lost, they're determined to do it anyway. Now this may hit some of you tonight. Thank God if it does. I don't get up here to preach intending to miss everybody in the congregation. I don't get up here intending to hit everybody in the congregation. I'm up here to preach the Word of God. But beloved, if the Word of God strikes you, then thank God for it. Amen. Young people, you need to be warned. Now those of you here who've made the mistake of marrying a lost person, you can't live in the past. You have to live with the past but you can't live in the past. If you've made a mistake, you've made a mistake. What you need to do is go on and serve God. Now I believe this also teaches us they took them wives of all which they chose. It teaches not only intermarrying in direct opposition to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Unless you think I'm just up here ranting and raving, I want to read to you what God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 14, now this is to the church which was at Corinth through the Apostle Paul. And he'd already told the church at Corinth that the things that he said were the commandments of God. I've heard some Baptists foolishly charge Paul with saying what he thought. Teaching the women ought to be silent in the church. Well, that's what Paul thought. Paul said, let every man know that I am telling you the commandments of the Lord. And when the Apostle Paul spoke and it's recorded in the Word of God, it's as true and it's as authoritative if the Lord Jesus Christ Himself spoke it because the Lord Jesus Christ called Him as an Apostle to the Gentiles and He was given the care of the churches to teach us what we are supposed to do today. And if you ever leave that foundation and drift away from that mooring, then you just well throw away the Word of God because you can pick and choose what you want out of it. It's right. still God's Word. It still means what it says. And when the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want to read this to you now, after I've tried to establish his authority to say it, be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Amen. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now that is exactly what happened in the days of Noah. They began to be unequally yoked together. The sons of God looked upon the daughters of men. And they took them wives of all which they chose. That means they took more than one wife too. Right. Now beloved, I know this is painful. Now I know it strikes people who've been married, who have multiple marriages, but it's still God's Word. 
There never was a time since the beginning of time when there were so many multiple marriages. And it's come into our Baptist churches. And as I said, concerning marrying a lost person, you can't live in the past, but you have to live with it. And anybody here who's been divorced and remarried knows what I'm talking about. And if you're a child of God, you'll agree with what I'm saying. It's hurtful to you. I love every child of God and I don't want to say anything to hurt anybody but at the same time beloved if through the preaching of the word of God I can warn one person here who has not suffered that don't you want me to warn them and to try to help them to avoid that kind of a thing I believe you do if you're saved because we do it with the right intention not being critical of anybody but preaching God's word that God has a foundational teaching in his word a principle that man and woman are to be joined together till death do we part Amen. now that's a principle now, I know that it's violated at times and I know sometimes beloved there are terrible consequences I'm not getting into that there are terrible circumstances but all the bitterness and the hatred the things that come out of these multiple marriages are time and I'm sure that you uh, can understand those of you who've experienced it these things surface and the pain and the hurt and the agony don't we want our young people to be uh, to be spared that if possible through the preaching of the word of God Amen. but my point is this as it was in the days of Noah even so shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man beloved it's here Amen. it's here it's in our churches. There was a time when divorce in a Baptist church was kind of a rare thing. But not so anymore. There are some things, beloved, that just can't be compromised. God has some principles. I used this illustration one time. You ever try to violate the law of gravity? You don't violate the law of gravity. You get up on a 12-story building and you jump off and you feel ever so good all the way down. <laughs> but you have violated God's law of gravity and when you hit the ground, you're not going to feel too good. Right. Now sometimes we violate what God gives us as principles in His Word and it feels ever so good for a while, but beloved, when you violate the principles that God has given us, you're going to hit the ground someday and when you hit the ground, it's going to be hurtful to you. Right, man. Amen. The things of the home, the principles that God gave us concerning the home have been violated. They've been ignored. People don't listen anymore. You preach, you preach, you preach, and they turn a deaf ear, and they go out and they say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and the same ones come back bitter and weeping and begging you to help them, and you don't have any answers for them. There's nothing you can do for them. Right. They violated the principle. Right. Whatsoever you sold. And shall you also read? It's hurtful. There's a breakdown today. There's a compromising. These men of God, these godly men, compromised. You know why they did it? I think the Bible's careful to tell us here. Notice with me in Genesis chapter 6. You ever read the Bible, but you don't read it? The sons of God saw, there's what I want you to see, there's the desire we talked about the other day, there's a drawing, there's the charm of sin. They saw, the daughters of men, that they were fair. Do you see that? Fair, fair. That's what drew them. So many young people get married today because, oh, she is so pretty. She is so popular. She is just it. But then when they marry her, she's it all right. Mm, mm, mm. What in the world have I got myself into? And the same thing with a man. Oh, he's handsome. He's got money. He's got everything in the world. He's got all I want. Until you marry him. And then you don't want anything he's got. You don't want him. I'll tell you, beloved, there are principles in the Word of God that we better not violate. It don't matter whether they're pretty or not. It don't matter whether they've got money. You find you a child of God. If you're saved by the grace of God, you find someone saved that loves the same thing you love, particularly the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll say more about that later. 
The days of Noah were days of compromising. They compromised the principles that God had given Adam and Eve. God joined them together. Genesis, God joined them together. And he said, now don't be put asunder. But they violated those principles. And they began to compromise. Now this thing, now notice with me, beloved. I, I believe what I'm saying. When you begin to compromise and intermarry, when you begin to marry lost people, those of you who are saved by the grace of God, it begins to affect not just the church, but it begins to affect society. Right. It begins to affect all of society. And the result is corruption, wickedness, ungodliness. And it's just because you violated one of the basic principles that God gave in the very... Do you realize God gave marriage before practically anything? Right. Marriage was one of the first principles of God given in the book of Genesis. And when you break that down, you're breaking down the whole moral structure of all of society that God has given us that we must live in. It's a time of compromise. The churches are affected by it. Society is affected by it. Churches are compromising today. They won't take a stand against sin. You know why? Because there's too many members in there that if they took a stand against sin, they'd have a split. So rather than split, they compromise. There's compromising today in our government. They do it in the name of politics. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. That's nothing but a fancy name for wickedness and taking bribes and ungodliness. And beloved, you're seeing the results of it in Washington today. And it's going to get worse. There's compromising everywhere you turn. People, you can't believe anything. Any man who's running for office, you cannot believe one word he says. Read my lips. Right. I lost a lot of confidence in the man. Read my lips. I read his lips. And I'm reading his lips today and they're not saying the same thing. I believe they can try to justify it, but there was a time when a man said, I won't do this. He would not do it. Right, right. There's a compromising today. There's a compromising spirit in everything. And it's simply because of a violation of the principles in the home. You may not believe this, but I believe the home affects a whole nation. It affects a whole nation. And when homes begin to break down, a nation begins to break down. Now, his, historians will tell you that too, if you want to read it. Compromising in government. The day is here. This is a day of compromise. As it was in the days of Noah. Even so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes back again. And it's here. Right. Compromising everywhere you turn. You don't know what anybody... You can, listen, I absolutely... I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I absolutely can't believe anything anybody tells me anymore. Now, there are exceptions with God's people. But I have just got so burned so many times when a person tells me something with the straightest face and the best of intentions, particularly when he says, I'm going to come to church Sunday. <laughs> I don't believe that rascal. <laughs> Maybe I should, but I don't believe him. When he comes in the back door, I believe him. Now, this is just the way it's got to be, folks. Compromising. The days are here. Secondly, look with me in verse 4, back in our text in Genesis 6. I know I need to give you these points. Look in verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men. Now see, here's the after effects of it. Now I wanted to point this out to you, and I did early, but in verse 3, after this breakdown in the homes, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. You think it's not serious when the homes begin to fall apart? It was serious to God. That's when he made the statement, My spirit's not going to strive with man. Right. And he numbered his days, 120 years. Now verse 4, please. There were giants. The sons of men came in unto the daughters of men. They bare children to them. The same become mighty men which were 
of old men of renown. Now, what is happening to this society, this generation in the days of Noah, when they begin to intermarry and begin to have multiple marriages? Began with Lamech when he took two wives. What began to happen to people? What began to happen to uh, the society, the generation that they were living among? I'll tell you what, it became highly competitive. Mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. A spirit of competition like you've never seen. Men striving to get ahead. Men wanting to be on top. Men wanting to be admired and looked up to. Men wanting to get their name in the paper so everyone would know them and look up to them. And they would be the ones of renown. Mighty men of old. That's the way it was in the days of Noah. Mighty men. Giants. You know how many millionaires there are in the United States of America today? They can't count them. Millionaires. People who have so much money they can't spend it in a lifetime. But beloved, when you consider some of them and you look at where they're making their millions, that's what really gets you. The music industry, so-called music, is producing more millionaires. The entertainment, so-called industry, is producing more millionaires than any hard work ever produced. And I'll tell you what, God does not approve of that. People get paid the kind of money they're paying for playing ball or singing or making movies and they're all men of renown and they're the ones who are being admired and looked up to and promoted and everybody wants to be like them. That's the way it was in the days of Noah. <laughs> Beloved, it was a time of competition. Everybody now has to have two jobs to buy three cars. I believe I heard Brother Morton say the other day <coughs> they borrow money to buy things they don't need so they can get the admiration of people they don't even like. Something like that. And that's true. <coughs> Trying to keep up with the Joneses and just about the time you catch up with them they refinance. <laughs> I think he said that too. <laughs> Just about the time you caught up with the Joneses, they refinance. <coughs> and they move the bar up another notch. And you got to go get a second job. Now, the husband's working two jobs and the wife's working one. And beloved, all this pressure that's put on people today is very real. Let me tell you, I, I've been teaching our Sunday school class, to our Sunday school, to our adult class about stress. It is something very real. You better realize it's real. You're under a lot of pressure today. People are under a lot of pressure. They talk about preachers being under pressure to produce. Well, it ain't just the preachers that are under pressure. It's everybody that's under pressure. This is a pressure-packed generation because everybody's trying to get ahead. They're afraid they're going to fall behind. Am I going to be able to meet my bills? Listen, beloved, it wasn't like this when I was a boy. I can remember running around in the mountains of West Virginia with no shoes on. Hardly ever wore a shirt. I didn't care about anything. We had very little to eat, but I was happy as if I didn't have any sense. It was a different generation. I don't feel that way now. I'm under pressure too. We're all under pressure. There's a lot of stress being put on people because of competition. And then thirdly, I want you to look in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination or the thought of his heart was only evil continually. There were not only days of competition when people were competing to get ahead, get ahead, get more, get more, get more. But beloved, according to this, were days of confusion. Confusion. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I'm going to go ask for a show of hands because I wouldn't want, I don't believe you would anyway, but how many of you have thought about committing suicide lately? So that's a crazy question. No, it isn't either. 
We live in a confused generation. People don't know how to get out of their problems. And they even at times let that silly thought cross their mind. These are times of confusion, beloved, like I've never seen. In the days of Noah, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. And isn't that the way it is where you live and where you go to work? Vulgarity, uncleanness, vileness. You open the newspaper, you have to close it up. It's, it's the, the more filth they put in there, that's how they sell newspapers. You turn on the television set, you can't even watch the news. They get pretty, pretty plain with that anymore. You watch some of these primetime specials that they put on, supposedly news-oriented, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Only evil continues. The most evil thing they can find to bring it all out in the open and let everybody see it. Evil continually. It's a confused generation. People are confused. Beloved, as a pastor, I must deal with problems that I can't even imagine. At I couldn't even imagine the kind of problems that, that come upon pastors today. I mean, things that... <laughs> there's just no answers. Amen. There are no answers to some of the problems that pastors have to face. Abortion. You realize how much time and money is being spent trying to turn the abortion law around? And a few years ago, I, didn't think, I never heard of abortion. Very few of us heard of abortion. But today, according to the last numbers I have, about 1.5 million babies a year are being aborted. Beloved, that's a problem. That's confusing. Homosexuals, what are we going to do about AIDS? People are confused. They don't know what to do about AIDS. Oh, it won't hurt you. Can a homosexual be a priest? <laughs> who would even who would even suggested such a vile, wicked thing a few years ago? It's confusion. Can homosexuals adopt children? Sick. Confusion. What about the drug problem? We don't know what to do. Confusion. There's no answers. There's sure enough confusion. You know what the Bible tells me? God is not the author of confusion. So the confusion that's in the world today, including AIDS and abortion and homosexuality and uh, even our economy, the mess that it's in, is because of the devil. It's not because of God. We must deal with such things as the Maplethorpe exhibit. I haven't seen it, and I'll guarantee you no child of God with, with any spirituality about him would want to. But what I read in the newspapers turns my stomach that such a thing would even be thought possible in our nation, in a nation of people that claim to be under God. It's disgusting and confusing. Two live crew and their music, so-called, again. Such things ought never, ought never to even come up. But it's the day we're living. As it was in the days of Noah, even so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Right. Let's go on. i got three more items I want to give you. <coughs> Look with me in verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. In verse 11, the Bible says the earth was filled with violence. There's never been more violence in the world than there is today. It, it's everywhere you turn. Ireland, South Africa, Middle East. 
Peru, Brazil, everywhere you turn, violence, violence, violence. You see, these are the days of corruption. Our government officials daily, daily, I'll guarantee daily, somebody in our nation and even in our state a lot of times is arrested for drunk and driving or arrested for accepting bribes. Did you read a paper this week? Every day. Corruption, corruption, corruption. Churches are being corrupted by pastors who are corrupting themselves and some of the members with them with all kinds of vileness and wickedness that a few years ago wouldn't have been thought of. The pews are filled with people who profess to be saved. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. But I ain't putting my drink in. Oh, how I love Jesus. But don't you expect me to come to church? Oh, how I love Jesus. Once saved, always saved. But I ain't going to do what you say, preacher. I'm not coming to listen to that no more. They've no more got the Spirit of Christ in them than the demons. The pews, beloved, are becoming filled with people who want to go to heaven but they don't want to do what the Word of God says. Right. Corrupt. That's corrupt religion. There was a time in our churches when the people who were members of the church were the most godly, moral people in the community and if they weren't, they didn't stay in the church. You exclude someone today for an ungodly life and see what happens. I've got the, the minutes of Bryan Station Baptist Church back to eight, uh, 1786 and I'll show you right in the beginning if you want to come and read it that they discipline people for lying. Amen. They discipline people for raiding on their neighbors. Listen, beloved, there was a time in our churches where it was a godly place and no corruption came in the church that wasn't dealt with. And they didn't draw any lines of favoritism had some black people in the church they were dealt with just like the whites yeah Brian Station had black members and now black member comes into the church and, they, uh, and some people that call themselves Christians can't accept the fact that that person can be saved and be a member of the Lord's church amen God's not the author of that either. If you've got that kind of prejudice in you, you need to spend some time on your knees asking God to forgive you and praying that God will give you the right kind of attitude. When a person's saved, they love the Lord, and they have to come to your church because there's no other New Testament church where they can serve the Lord, you better receive them with open arms. God doesn't make a difference. Amen. But beloved, we live in a time of corruption, days of corruption. I'm going to get through and I hope you don't get up and leave before I finish. You know, it's enough to drive you to seclusion. I feel like sometimes just throwing up my hand and say, I, I get up. Where's the mountains? I'm just going to run up in the hills somewhere and, and get away from everything and everybody, and I won't be bothered. With I just get totally confused. And I say, let me away. Let me alone. Leave me alone. Let me get away from this corruption. But it's up there too. But I want you to notice something. Looking with me in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'll tell you what. If I had to leave you where I've taken you, I'd feel bad. But even in the midst of all that wickedness in the days, as it was in the days of Noah. <laughs> Follow me now. As it was in the days of Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Even so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. There's some of us that have found grace in the eyes of the Lord today. And beloved, in spite of all of the compromising and in spite of all the corruption and all the wickedness, we found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's don't lose that great joy that we ought to have. Amen. Noah found grace, and I found grace. And thank God for it. Days of compassion, the Lord still has pity on his people. Noah was a just man, the Bible says. And perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. <laughs> As it was in the days of Noah. So that, I believe we ought to find some of those people in our day, don't you? Just people. Honest people. Upright people. Moral people. That walk with God. And I believe you find them in the right kind of church. 
still true today. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, I endure all things for the elect's sake. You know what keeps me from quitting? <laughs> you know why I don't throw up my hands when I want to and run for the mountains? <laughs> God's still got some people. Yeah. I endure all things. I, I can endure it, beloved. And you can too for the elect's sake. I don't like it. I don't like the way it affects my children. I don't like to even think about my grandchildren. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so have I. And so have many of you tonight. God's still saving people. And then there was days, as we look in verse, notice this with me, in verse 13 and 14, and God said unto Noah. Now God didn't say to those who had corrupted themselves with the sons of, of, the, of the daughters of men. But God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence. You know if I preach this message today over the radio. Or if I had the chance to stand in a football stadium with 57,000 up at Commonwealth. You know what they'd say? They'd laugh me into the ridge. They'd all, yeah they'd boo. You're right brother. They'd boo me when I get a boo, boo, boo. Why oh, you big pessimist you. <laughs> God said to Noah. And God's saying to us. Though the world won't believe it. We still believe it. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and I'll destroy them with the earth. These were days, as he says in verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. You make a way of escape. I'm going to destroy the world with a flood, but you make a way of escape. You do. You begin to construct. You begin to build. And beloved, I believe God's calling upon us today as his people to build. We're to build our homes. Though the world's tearing our homes down and though the world would try to destroy us, we're still to build our homes. You know, sometimes when you build a home and you find a flaw in it, you can't do anything about the flaw, so you support it up. And I believe sometimes when we get problems in our life that there's nothing we can do about, we've already made a mistake, we have to support that up and we have to go on and serve God the best we can. But we're to build. We're to build our homes. We're to build the Lord's church. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that includes this day. Amen. Beloved, they can't do a thing to us if we'll follow the Lord. We're to build God's kingdom by preaching the gospel. We're to build and keep on building till Jesus comes. Amen. And if everybody else forsakes the Lord and they all go back, we must go on and be faithful to Him. Last of all, look with me in verse 17. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. The days of Noah were the days of condemnation. God condemned the earth, and he said, I'm going to destroy it. Days of condemnation. As it was in the days of Noah, even so shall it be. And we see in chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. They all died. Now I read that to you because I want you to notice. God kept his word. Amen. He told Noah the end of all flesh has come before me, you build an ark. And God kept his word. And Peter says... The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. God's going to keep his word. Because one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But beloved, this earth is going to be destroyed by fire. God's going to destroy it. The first time he said, I destroyed it with water. And the next time he shakes the earth, he's going to shake it. Not just the earth, but the heavens also. And it's all going to pass away with a great noise. And it's going to all burn up because God is a consuming fire. And he's going to consume everything with fire. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. If you're here tonight and you're lost, Oh, I've heard that before. I've heard that since all my life. I hope that's true. I hope you've heard that all your life because it should have been preached all your life. But Jesus Christ is coming again. If you're here and lost, you ought to be afraid to walk out that door. 
You ought to be afraid to leave this place where you know there's godly people that love the Lord and where they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You ought to want that grace. You ought to want to talk to this pastor. You ought to want to ask him, Brother Bill, what do I need? How do I understand? How do I grasp? I want to find this grace. If you're lost and in your sins, the wrath of God is on you right now and the only thing that keeps you out of hell is the goodness and mercy and grace of God. And any time He wants, He can snap you out. Right. And if He does, and you die without this grace that Noah found, you're going to spend an eternity paying for your sins. Right. Won't you come to Christ today? Jesus Christ shed His blood. He paid the price took the sin debt of all those who believe upon him and was punished in their place but that means nothing to you until you receive it until you believe it and accept it with all your heart you're still lost you're still in your sins can you come to him tonight those of us who are saved oh I tell you we ought to serve the Lord it's a wonderful time and yet it's, isn't it a terrible time I, I hate to think about all of the negative things but it's a reality isn't it but through it all, even in spite of all of the negative things, I still see the grace of God working in my life. I'm not what I want to be, but beloved, I'm not what I could be, and I'm not what I used to be. But I'll tell you this, I'm not what I'm going to be someday when He does come. At His coming, now you talk about something, we're really going to be something then because we're going to be like Him. You won't find a single, you may find a lot of fault in me, that fault in my preaching, fault in my looks, fault you just find faults everywhere but you won't find any faults in me when he comes I'm going to be perfect and I'm going to be everything he wants me to be that's grace Noah found grace and I found grace have you found grace today if you're not serving God you remember this church you need to get close to the Lord let's stand sing him